Section 19190 in the name of Colin Smith on Don't Extend the ScotRail Franchise. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Colin Smith to speak to and move the motion for up to six minutes, please, Mr Smith. Thank you, President Officer. It's decision time for the Scottish Government. Time for them to decide whether to reward failure by extending the current Abelio ScotRail franchise until 2025 or for once put passengers and rail workers first and serve notice that they will end this failing franchise at the first expiry date in March 2022. When this Parliament last debated, when this Parliament last debated the ScotRail franchise, I have to say it's part of Labour business, of course, because the SNP don't have the guts to call a debate in government time and defend their record. I highlighted the fact that on every single measure of performance, punctuality, cancellations, capacity, it was a case of fail, fail, fail. Even although the SNP government had gone to every length to bail out Abilio with backroom deals to move targets and give them a licence to fail. But, President Officer, little did we know that that was just the start. Because since that debate, the low performance record then has been broken over and over and over again. So much so that Abelio have now breached the franchise, not once, not twice, but three times on punctuality, on cancellations, and unsurprisingly, on passenger satisfaction. In fact, Abelio don't even expect to hit their passenger satisfaction target for another two years, and only then because Transport Scotland have lowered that target. Missing the passenger satisfaction target once is a breach of the franchise. Missing it for two consecutive years is an event of default and supposed to be grounds to be stripped of the franchise altogether. Yet had Transport Scotland not lowered the target, ScotRail would be on track to miss their passenger satisfaction target a shocking five years in a row. And when it comes to punctuality, the record is equally abysmal. Abelia have failed to hit their target since 2015. So I put this challenge to the Transport Secretary today. Will he stand up now and tell this chamber, and more importantly, Scotland's hard-pressed rail passengers, whether he believes a Bailey or Scott Rail will ever meet their punctuality target, and if so, when? Well, he's refusing to do so, because frankly, no one, no one seriously believes a Bailey will hit the target in the lifetime of this franchise. President officer, what is the point of performance targets and a franchise agreement when this government and this transport secretary isn't prepared to enforce them? <laughs> the truth is, despite two improvement plans and remedial plans to improve punctuality, performance has got worse since this franchise began, not better. Since the SNP handed Abelio the franchise in what they described as a world-leading deal, a shocking 75,000 trains have been cancelled. That's an average of 47 each and every day. But in 2018-19, that number actually increased by more than 60% to an average of 74 trains a day. And despite the arrival of the, the long-awaited new rolling stock, ScotRail's performance under the service quality incentive regime isn't much better. This scheme monitors the state of trains and stations across a range of measures, cleanliness, safety, accessibility and staffing. Abelio consistently missed two-thirds of the target set under Squire, and they haven't hit more than half since 2016, racking up £13 million in fines. And to make matters worse, rail fares have rocketed under this government. In the case of season tickets, by an eye-watering 54 per cent since the SNP came to power, with another rail fare hike set to be imposed by the government in January. No wonder rail passenger figures failed to increase last year for the first time in decades. But, President Officer, this Parliament has the opportunity to deliver change. Labour's motion today would mean the government serving notice on Abelio, bringing this failing franchise to an end in 2022, not extending it to 2025. Extending the franchise, frankly, would reward failure. It would send a signal to private rail operators. It doesn't matter how poor your performance is, you won't ever have to deliver on your franchise targets. Ending the franchise in 2022, however, would give the government two years to put in place a public sector operator bid. Now, I hope in that time we'll see a change of UK government. A Labour government would end the wasteful and inefficient franchising system altogether, repealing 
repealing the Tories' 1993 Railways Act so we can have a proper public ownership of our railways, bringing train and track together under a single publicly owned company with decisions, however, but with all decisions, but with all decisions being made here in Scotland on Scottish routes. I'll give way to the member if I have time. I think I'm in the last minute. John Mason. Could the member explain how it can be one GB wide company, but it would be controlled in Scotland? Colin Smith. <laughs> well, Mr Mason clearly doesn't understand how rail services actually work. The services oh. delivered on the Scott Rail Network would continue to be devolved to this parliament. The decisions would be made by this parliament and what services that company provides here in Scotland. That's how it works at the moment. Obviously, Mr Mason hasn't noticed that rail services actually cross borders and don't stop at Gretna. That's why we believe in public ownership right across the whole of the UK, not a continuation of private firms yeah. in England. But I have to say, even members who don't support public ownership must see that the current franchise is just not working. So when it comes to the vote later today, those members will have a very clear choice. A choice between putting passengers first or continuing to put the profits of the privatised utilities first by allowing this failed franchise to continue. My motion makes clear whose side Labour are on. We are on this side of the staff and their trade unions, as left, the RMT, the TSSA, who all back Labour's motion today because they've had enough of Abelio's mismanagement and this government's inaction. We are on the side of Scotland's hard-pressed commuters facing the misery of delays, cancellations, overcrowding and fare hikes. Presiding officer, Labour is on the side of passengers, not the private profiteers fleecing those passengers. So I move the motion in my name and call on Parliament to back it when we come to vote. I now call on Michael Matheson to speak to and move amendment 19190.2 for four minutes, please. Uh, President officer, I move the amendment in my name. It real plays an essential role in the daily fabric of Scottish life, connecting communities, enabling opportunities and supporting economic prosperity. Uh, this government has invested a record £8 billion to improve our railways, with more services and more trains than ever before. Alongside this investment, we have set high performance standards for the rail industry. In fact, the highest, the highest set for any franchise in the UK. However, President Officer, would the member just let me make a bit of progress, first of all, please? However, President Officer, I recognise that elements of ScotRail's operations have not performed to the levels specified and required by this government and the franchise. That's why we have taken robust action through the contractual measures available to us within the ScotRail franchise to demand that improvements are delivered via the remedial plans. ScotRail are in no doubt that performance must improve in line with the forecast contained within the performance remedial plans. This is a necessary step towards meeting the Scottish Government's challenging but achievable public performance measure target of 92.5% set for both ScotRail and Network Rail in Scotland. I'll give way to Mr Finlay. Neil can Finlay. I, can I ask a very particular question to the Cabinet Secretary? Is the Cabinet Secretary 100% confident Abellio will meet its commitment to pay staff salaries every month until the scheduled end of their contract? Michael uh, Matheson. So, no, so as part of the franchise, financially, they must be able to achieve that. Otherwise, they will uh, breach the whole uh, contract in itself. So, no, sir, however, I also think it would be wrong for us to ignore some of the wider systemic problems within our rail system. The existing franchise system is costly and complex. In my view, as I stated before, it's no longer fit for purpose. The Rail Delivery Group have called for change to the system. Keith Williams, who is leading the recurrent review of UK railways, has said that franchising cannot continue the way it is today. Alongside this, we have Network Rail managing our rail infrastructure, which despite receiving the majority of its funding for its operations in Scotland from the Scottish Government, it is accountable to UK ministers. President officer, this leaves us with a rail industry in Scotland, which is full of dedicated people trying to do the right thing, but operating in an industry which is unnecessarily complicated in its structure and does not serve the travelling public. The Williams Review has the potential to fundamentally change our rail system for the better. And any approach we take forward here in Scotland needs to take account of the potential changes the review could introduce. I believe that better system can be achieved through a public sector controlled railway network here in Scotland. 
ending the ritual of franchising and the uncertainty created for staff every time a franchise is challenged or the franchise has to be renewed. Operating within the public sector would bring consistency of approach, ensuring rail infrastructure is aligned with passenger services here in Scotland. Under the current UK legislation, we only have the power to franchise for the running of rail services in Scotland. The law will secure the ability of a public sector body being able to compete for a franchise. It does not change the broken franchise system and it still leaves us with the complicated rail system we have today. But let me also be clear. The decision on the future of ScotRail franchise will be based on a rigorous detailed evaluation of what is the right thing to do for passengers, communities and for the taxpayer. But simply ending the contract today would not wave a magic wand to fix the challenges we have within our rail network. And rushing into a decision to end a franchise early without correct due diligence would not be in passengers or the Scottish taxpayers' interest. Saying officer, the Williams Review has the potential to reform the structures of Scotland's railways in a positive way, ensuring passengers and communities are at its very heart. And I believe that that can be delivered through a public sector railway here in Scotland. And I call on everyone, including the leader of the Labour Party, who says he wants a public sector railway service here in Scotland, to vote for our amendment here today, to allow us to make sure that we can deliver that here in Scotland for the travelling public in Scotland. Stand up and show some leadership. I know it's something that you often struggle with. I now call Jamie Green to speak to you and move amendment 19190.1 for four minutes, please, Mr Green. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. This is it's getting lively already. I'm quite enjoying this debate. Um, let me get straight to the point. I've only got a few minutes. Um, we will not be supporting uh, Labour's motion today, and I'm going, to explain, I'm going to explain why. If they'll just chirp down for a second, please listen. No one, no one in this chamber, I think, can say that the current franchise is working perfectly for everyone in every part of Scotland. And nor do I actually think there's any long-term strategy for our country's railways. But let's look unobjectionally at why pulling the rug from under the feet of the current operator will do more harm than good. First of all is what message does it send? That if you sign up and invest in a franchise, invest billions of pounds, but the political whim changes and terminates your contract early, Anybody that knows anything about how real franchises work know that it is in the last crucial few years where you start to see the fruit of your investment. And let's also understand that this debate isn't about early termination. As we've heard, the mask has dropped today. This debate is about calling for nationalisation, but nowhere in the motion does it even pretend to do so. We know that because that's the media headlines that Labour have been putting out. We know that because there are unions demonstrating outside. Now, I understand and respect Labour wanting to make a political point here, but that is not an ideology, an unfunded ideology, that these benches are willing to sign up to. And let's also look at what Labour are asking for. Let's get our terminology accurate here. They are not, this isn't about unduly extending a franchise, and nor is this about rewarding poor performance. They're calling for early termination of a 10-year agreement. Under the existing franchise, the taxpayer is paying 20% less than the previous franchise, but we've seen a 30% increase in carriages, a 10% increase in the number of weekday services, and a 13% increase in the number of railway jobs in Scotland. I thought that's something that those benches would have been grateful for. I'm not saying the current franchise is perfect either, We'll be the first to stand up and hold Mr. Matheson to account when it fails. But what I'm saying is, let's not spend the next two years wasting time and money, up to £10 million on a public sector bid, when we should be focusing on delivering on the infrastructure that we have. ScotRail are under two very serious remedial notices right, right now. These are legal contractual agreements between the government and the operator. And the deadline for meeting those requirements comes after the date by which the early termination decision would have to be made. In my view, to call for it now would be short-sighted to preempt future performance. Let's give them a go to succeed. Now, some will know, and others might not, 
that one of the largest pieces of review into infrastructure and rail infrastructure in this country is going on right now, the Williams Review. And if it's published anytime soon, we will find out if the current franchise model will even exist in the landscape in the future. Now, the Scot Scottish Government's amendment in that regard uh, alludes to that and contains some sensible language around that. But the Scottish Government also contractually reserves the right to issue a default notice right now if it deems it appropriate. Let's be clear, if you, when you stopped arguing amongst yeah, yourselves, listen, please listen. listen you might look. Let's be clear that an immediate termination would require the government to step in and be the operator of last resort. The government, in my view, is not ready to do that. Now, Labour wants to strip Scotland of the franchise for no other reason than to grab a headline. This is all about nationalisation to them and nothing to do about delivering Scotland's railway. Nowhere in this debate have we heard uh, a single word, and probably nor will we, about how much it's going to cost to nationalise our railways. But we will hold the Berlioz to account, and we will hold the SNP to account, but we will do it in a measured and sensible way. I want to hear some vision from the government, one which uh, meets its objectives on delivering a railway that's fit for purpose. That's the real challenge we should be discussing today, and I hope it's one that the government rises to. Could you move your amendment, Mr Green? I move the amendment in my name. Uh, now call John Finney for four minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much indeed, President Officer. I have a f number of declarations to make. I'm a member of the RMT parliamentary group. I'm a vice president of the Friends of the Far North Line. I'm a regular rail user. I want Scotland's railways to be a success. I don't support the franchising system. As we know from East Coast, there were significant profits went to the UK Exchequer, 800 million. Uh, Scottish Greens at this same time will be supporting the, the Scottish Labour Party. Significantly will be supporting the, the rail, rail unions. Um, and I have to say, as, as, a, as a regular rail user, I've experienced the frustrations that others have. Um, I also want to try and put some balance into it. As an elected politician, of course our job is to scrutinise and promote. So I, I wouldn't want any of what's said to be viewed as being um, uh, discourteous in any way or uh, not recognising the valuable contribution our rail staff have made um, at, at, at all levels. I have to say, much of the debate around issues in the past has been fairly ill-informed. I was part of the REC committee that visited the Network Rail Scotrail um, Control Centre in Glasgow recently, and we literally sat in a room with the, the network on, on a, a screen behind us, and it was significant to see the, and have explained to us the implications of three delays um, and the effect that had on the East Coast, particularly the Fife Circle with the different speeds of trains and a delayed departure from Edinburgh. A, a, a similarly on the West, the significant thing, and my colleagues will uh, confirm that this is the case, that each of the three trains involved was actually a cross-border train. It wasn't ScotRail. So passengers feel the effect of that regardless. Um, so I, I think it's fair to say that. Likewise, things like the West Highland Line, the landslip, the great work that went on there, uh, that is about monitoring. And if we remove the franchise, these things won't change. However, we've, we've got the briefings in Mr. Green loyally laid out the Abello briefing there. I'll not repeat some of it, but um, the, the talk about their demand is to meet a better public transport. And the question is, has it met that? And I have to say, the public aren't interested in performance figures. They want to know that the train turns up in time and it's clean, and uh, uh, that's what they're... Um, they, they talk about reducing the carbon as passengers' numbers have doubled. Well, delivering 40-year-old diesel trains that deposit human excrement onto the track, and I know that's brewing, is, is not an example of that. And they talk about the biggest investment since the Victorian era. Well, the journey times between Inverness and the Central Belt are the same as the Victorian era, so um, there's much, much the same. Um, I'm told that uh, Abella have had 42 directors, seven HR directors, and that we know that to function the, 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 the uh, required staff to work the rest days. In the very short time I have, I want to concentrate on the, the Scottish Government motion. Apparently, um, the Scottish Government has already started the careful and necessary assessment specified in the fine test contract to determine Scott Rail contract end date. Well, as a member of the public sector bidder stakeholder reference group, if you remember them, Cabinet Secretary, I might have known that already, but of course I don't know that because that group hasn't met this year and we've not had an update. So where are we, for instance, with CalMac? Now this, yes, absolutely. Yep. Michael Matheson. Uh, as I made very clear, uh, that group will meet again once we know the outcome of the Williams Review and the implications that will have for the future structure of it. But the member should also recognise that the remit of that group is not to evaluate the franchise. It was to look at a public sector bid for a franchise. 
John Finney. Y yes, indeed. Um, so I would have hoped to have some update, for instance, on where we are with CalMAX involvement in that, because this group was launched with great gusto by your predecessor, uh, Mr Yousaf. And I have to say, Cabinet Secretary, and I did say this to you in person after it, the last meeting was a bit of a damp squib. And I do get the impression that questions about public ownership, nationalisation, any terminology around that is wheeled out by the Scottish Government at any time of crisis. That's what happens. It gets kicked into the long grass. The Williams review isn't long grass. It's a very, very long siding and a convenient siding. So uh, I have to say we need to know at what uh, um, my colleague Colin Smith's talked about uh, the timing. Timing is absolutely crucial with this. There are windows of opportunity and I fear these windows of opportunity are going to be uh, lost. Now, Support over, overdue and necessary change, yes. Well, I, of course, the Scottish Greens support the full devolution of network here, but that's for, another, that's for another day. It is about the timing of this franchise. It is about responding to a very, very specific and not unreasonable request from the Labour Party. It is about whose interests are being served. Uh, operator of last resort for vital public services, the government should be the operator of first and only resort. Mike Rumbles, four minutes, please. Since Abellio started running our trains, cancellations have increased year by year. Skip stopping have become almost part of everyday expectations. The punctuality of our trains declined and passenger complaints have risen, according to the consumer magazine, which to record levels. Indeed, fines doled out at Abellio under the Squire regime, that's a service quality incentive regime, designed to fine the company for poor standards of service at our stations and on our trains show that these fines have averaged over a million pounds for each and every one of the last nine quarters. When I lodged a parliamentary question earlier this year asking exactly how much was paid out to com complaining customers, our passengers, the Cabinet Secretary confirmed that in the last financial year, Abellio paid out £1,119,818 to passengers in compensation, up from 600000 the year before. In March this year, at one of his regular appearances at the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee, Alex Hines, the managing director of Abellio, concentrated on the positive aspects of Abellio, and Jamie Green mentioned some of them. Yes, there are some. They've increased the number of train services, they've increased the number of seats available on their journeys, and perhaps more importantly to the Scottish Government, they've received less of a subsidy than their previous operator. And this last point might explain why the Scottish Government seems so reluctant to take Abellio properly to task for its poor performance. Presiding officer, we've had three improvement or remedial plans, not two, three, and, uh, under two transport secretaries. They've contained 249 action points, 20 improvement measures, and now we have the current remedial plan with nine initiatives. If Abellio's performance last year was the worst for our railways in 10 years, with passenger compensation rising to 1.1 million, and Alex Hines admitting in committee that his company will not hit the targets he agreed to by the end of the current franchise, why is it that the Scottish Government, instead of penalising Abellio for some of the worst performances on record, it waived performance penalties and made advance payments of over 20 million to the company? Rather than endless initiatives and little improvement, the public simply want to have a railway that delivers the agreed level of service. Unfortunately, I haven't got time, Jimmy, or I would. Turning to the amendments, we cannot support, the Liberal Democrats cannot support the government's amendment because it seems yet again to say what the government always says about almost everything. If only we had all the powers delivered to us, we would do so much better. Well, we don't believe that, and nor should anyone else. And for the Cabinet Secretary to say he won't rush into decisions, it makes me almost, almost speechless. Turning now to the Conservative amendment in Jamie Green's name, and it is rather a disappointing one. Jamie Green and I sit on the very same committee, but you wouldn't think it. We've heard month after month after month of the repeated failings and excuses of Abellio. I cannot believe that the Conservatives want to let Abellio off the hook. In their motion, they forget this isn't the second immediate plan, as I said already, it's their third, and they still they can't reach their agreed targets. 
But what we need to give them another chance, they see, and I just think that's pathetic. The Conservatives will not be thanked by long-suffering rail passengers for their, their inaction over this. We believe that the Labour motion before us today needs to be supported. That's what we would do. If it isn't, we let down long-suffering passengers throughout Scotland. In the words of the motion before us, we believe that the franchise given to Abellio should not be extended beyond the first expiry date of 2022. If that's the case, then the Scottish Government needs to give Abellio due notice of that effect by April next year. Presiding officer, the Cabinet Secretary needs to warn Abellio that considering that its managing director himself said that the company will not reach the required performance targets during the lifetime of the franchise, Abellio should expect such a notice to be given. And I'm disappointed by, if I may say so, and I don't mean to be disrespectful to Jamie Green. It's a naive approach taken by Jamie Green here on behalf of the Conservative Party. We should Thank all take this opportunity tonight, now, to be supporting the motion from the Labour Party. Thank you. We now move to the open part of the debate. I call it Elaine Smith to be called, followed by John Mason. Elaine Smith. Thank you, presiding officer. And can I point out to the chamber, I've got a registered interest as a member of Unite the Union, and I'm contributing to this debate as the convener of the RMT's parliamentary group. And can I welcome members of the RMT to the gallery this evening, um, this afternoon, sorry. But I'm also contributing because I personally, along with many other MSPs and parliamentary staff, want to be able to rely on our rail services. Presiding officer, we all know that the travelling public is just quite simply scunnered with our train services and the ever-increasing and unaffordable costs. They cannot rely on the trains to come in time, if indeed they come at all. They don't know when they might see their stop rushing by as the train skips past it. And when they do manage to get on a train, they can be jammed in like sardines. The situation during the Edinburgh Festival was quite simply shocking. Mm. Passengers were not only uncomfortable, but it was also dangerous. Mm -hmm. Presiding officer, I was in Bangladesh last year and I saw packed trains with passengers riding on top. And that is a terrifying sight in a developing country. But to hear first-hand accounts from friends and constituents of the crush to get on the trains on the weekend of Saturday, the 24th of August, is also terrifying. And frankly, it's a miracle that no one was seriously injured. It also highlights the need for guards on our trains and staff on the platforms. Driver-only uh, driver operated trains can not only become uncomfortably overcrowded, but also dangerously overcrowded. And at this point, presiding officer, I want to emphasise the failings of ScotRail are not the fault of their hard-working staff, whether that's administrative, drivers, ticket sellers, collectors or guards. In fact, they too are suffering uh, from the failure of Abellio, and they know that. And no amount of spin by Abellio to their staff today calling this debate negative changes that fact. The RMT has currently advised ScotRail that they're in dispute over a wide range of issues. These include closing ticket sale windows in many travel centres, conductors raising concerns about a reduction in safety briefings, and ticket examiners issued with machines that are not fit for purpose and are causing work-related stress. At the same time, the highest paid company director received an increase of £20,000, bringing the total salary to £305,000. Presiding officer, there is concern among staff that Abellio is running the company into the ground. The last available figures show that the company have been posting a loss while receiving increased grant subsidy from Transport Scotland, but of course, making sure that Dutch State Railways was paid the interest that they were owed. So in Scotland, our travelling public suffer, our taxpayers pay out and the Dutch State Railway gains. When will this farce finish? <laughs> but of course, that's entirely up to the SNP government. It could finish in 2022 with the break clause. And that clause is in the contract for precisely this sort of reason. When an operator isn't performing, it's a chance to get rid of them and find a better option. And we know Abellio isn't performing. We know this because the First Minister herself said earlier this year that they were in, and I quote, the last chance saloon. So the question then arises as to which operator replaces Abellio. The Scottish Government used to be committed to a public sector bid, but as we've heard, the public sector bidder stakeholder reference group which includes the trade unions, has not met at all this year. It should be meeting now. It met under the previous Cabinet Secretary 
and there should not be excuses, it should be meeting. Then we also look at the time scale for giving notice. Hamza Yusuf said 30th of September this year, Michael Matheson in July says that it's March 2020. But that also begs the question as to why the remedial period ends in May 2020. That makes no sense at all, unless the Scottish Government are simply going to allow this failing Abellio franchise to continue and allow the travelling public to continue suffering from overcrowded, late cancelled and costly train services. Earlier this month, uh, the Transport Secretary said there were ongoing plans in place for the provision of the operator of last resort. So what are those plans and when will they be actioned? Thankfully, presiding officer, our citizens don't have to travel on top of trains. But in a rich, developed country like Scotland, surely train travel should be cost-effective, reliable and safe. Remove a bellio, put people before profit and bring our rail services back into public ownership. Support Labour's motion and reject the Scottish Government's spin. Thank you. Can I call John Mason to be followed by Liam Kerr? John Mason. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I'm very pleased to take part in today's debate on rail. As I think members know, I am very enthusiastic about train travel and co convene the cross party group on rail with Pauline McNeill. I think we have a very good rail system in Scotland, although there is always room for improvement. Over the last eight or nine days, I've used the train nine times, spending about 12 hours on ScotRail trains. That has included travelling here on the Airdrie Bathgate line going to watch my football team happily beat Jackie Bailey's in Dumbarton, and on Monday's Glasgow holiday, having a day out to Fort William. All nine trains were as close to time as made no difference. In particular, we should be really proud of the West Highland Line, where the quality of trains is so much better than it used to be, complete with Wi-Fi, charging points, tea, coffee, beer, etc., on sale. Also, as a Glasgow MSP, I have to say that the city has an excellent rail system, uh, no thanks. Uh, in recent years, I have visited a number of European cities and I always use the local trains and metro networks. I would argue that Glasgow has a much better system than Rome, Lisbon, St. Petersburg, Marseille, to mention just a few. However, all of that is not to say that ScotRail has not had some problems, but I would argue that some of these are teething problems, including the electrification and new rolling stock, on the Glasgow-Edinburgh via Falkirk and via Schott's lines and the Dunblane line, and improvements on the edge of city services with upgraded rolling stock. We had Queen Street Tunnel closed and Queen Street itself is being rebuilt, with two platforms currently being extended and out of action. The fact that most trains have continued running through that period, I think, is highly commendable and well worth some gratitude to the staff who have often to work at night to minimise disruption. One of Labour's big criticisms has been that 47 trains per day have been cancelled. That sounds a lot, but let's remember that ScotRail run 2,400 trains per day. So that is barely 2% not running, 98% of the trains are running. Now I accept that the SNP sits somewhere in the middle as we support a mixed economy in contrast to the somewhat extreme Conservatives who would want to prive privatised almost everything, and the somewhat extreme Labour Party who would nationalise every loss-making business in the land. I personally am sympathetic to a publicly owned and operated railway, but frankly it would still face problems and challenges. I do remember publicly owned British Rail, and it was not a total success. It still needed a lot of public money, and some felt that it was not really run for the passengers, but more for the benefit of the railway staff themselves. And, of course, the poor quality of food and BR was a standing joke. So we need to get a balance between the railways firstly being a public service, secondly being a good employer, and thirdly being efficient and not wasting public money. And we should not forget the evidence we had at the REC Committee from publicly owned Lothian buses, that ownership was not a factor in their success, and how they successfully operate their well-regarded bus service. Uh, yes? John Finney. I'm, I'm very grateful for the member taking an intervention at that point. Would the member recognise that they turned round a failing commercial operation in East Lothian, that publicly operated bus service? John Mason. Yes, happy to recognise that. We also have to consider the question of cost. We currently subsidise the railway to the tune of some two-thirds. So if I buy a ticket for £20, then the actual cost is more like £60. As far as I can see, a belly one not making a profit out of ScotRail, so we might need to increase the subsidy just to maintain the present service if we brought it into public ownership. Should we be increasing the spending on rail? For the Greens, they have a clear policy of building fewer roads and investing more in public transport and active travel. That is a credible position. But what is Labour's position? 
Would they also cut road expenditure, or would they cut health and education to put more into trains? There have also been suggestions from the RMT and others that train fares are too high and there should be no more increases. But if there are no fare increases, presumably that means there can be no pay increases for the staff, and surely that is not acceptable. So in conclusion, yes, let's aim to improve our railways, but let's also be very proud of the system we have and very grateful for those who make it work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mason. I call Liam Kerr to be followed by Neil, no, by, followed by Joe McAlpine. Liam Kerr, followed by Joe McAlpine. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Now look, like a stopped clock, even Colin Smith is right occasionally, and is highlighting the huge frustration felt by commuters, tourists, and businesses as another train is cancelled or is delayed due to following a stopping service through Fife, or the aircon has decided to pack in, is absolutely justified. Serious problems require serious solutions. But like a broken record, the member comes back to this chamber six months after the last time, offering no practical solutions whatsoever. Now let's look at the delays since 2015 that Colin Smith referenced. Statistically, more than half of those were the responsibility of Network Rail a publicly owned company, incidentally. Now that's the track, the signalling, the infrastructure. Over the last year, just over 40% of cancellations were caused by track or signalling issues. Changing the franchisee fails to address that. A further 10% of delays or cancellations in Scotland are caused by non-ScotRail operators. Changing the franchisee fails to address that. Then there's the weather. If I recall correctly, an underlying cause of two thirds of delays in 2018 was Storm Alley. And this summer, more than 60% of average rainfall fell in a three hour period in August, significantly impacting the West Highland line that John Mason eulogized and the main Edinburgh Glasgow line at Winchborough. Changing the franchisee fails to address that. Yeah. And according to the latest performance stats, what were the incidents that caused the most disruptions to services last month? A passenger pulling the emergency alarm on a service leaving Glasgow Central. An incident on the fourth rail bridge. An incident requiring the emergency services at Falkirk Grahamston. Changing the franchisee fails to address that. Now, of course, sometimes trains break down. But remember, the franchisee doesn't actually own the stock. It's all leased from Roscoe's, Porterbrook, Angel Trains, or Evershop, with the exception of the Caledonian Rail leasing owned Class 385s. Any new franchisee is just gonna be working with the same kit. Now admittedly, the current franchisee does its own maintenance on its 225 DMUs and EMUs, but the same people will still be doing the maintenance both before and after any retendering. And I am certain that Labour do not question the professionalism and dedication of those who do a very difficult job on increasingly aged stock, because I am certainly not. And what of that stock? Well, the current franchisee has tried to upgrade it. 26 refurbished high street trains were ordered from Angel Trains, but the Roscoe subcontracted those, the refurbishment to Wabtec, who failed to deliver on the contract, leading to the unrefurbished sets that John Finney mentioned. Changing the franchisee fails to address that. And does changing the franchisee solve the overcrowding that Elaine Smith mentioned? No, because there needs to be track capacity available and more trains to do that. And as Labour know well from my speech in February, in which I also showed why their plans couldn't reduce ticket prices, the infrastructure is pretty much at capacity. You do not change that by a knee-jerk expulsion of a franchisee. Presiding officer, I accept our railway is not up to scratch, and I will not stand here and cheerlead for any of the agents I've discussed today, especially not a government that refuses to lead or invest outside the central belt. Not in my last 30 seconds, Mr. Finlay. But, presiding officer, instead of wasting time debating break clauses and models of franchise ownership, let's focus on those positive interventions and solutions that would actually make a difference to Scotland's railway. This motion is short-sighted, naive, and betrays a fundamental ignorance about Scotland's railways, much like Labour's transport policy in general. Thank you very much. I call John McAlpine to be followed by Neil Bibby. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. The current rail service delivery model is flawed, like a great many matters still under Westminster control. Network Rail is responsible, as we have heard, for a majority of rail delay, yet it's unaccountable to the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government has limited scope in its operations. And now we hear that Colin Smythe and the Labour Party want to replicate 
that dysfunctional arrangement for network rail and apply it to the ScotRail franchise. A GB-wide nationalised company would mean that this parliament would have no control over rail services and investment in Scotland. I support public ownership, but not centralised and regulated from London as Labour claim that they want. They should speak to people in the industry who do remember British Rail because those people have told me that Scotland back then was often starved of investment and was often palmed off with second-hand rolling stock. I agree with the Cabinet Secretary that the private franchise system put in place by Mrs Thatcher and retained for many, many years by the Labour governments under Tony Blair and Gordon Brown uh, was certainly not satisfactory. But having some control here in Scotland has been beneficial. The number of staff has grown from 4,779 to 5,272. We have new services and new stations. And even under Abilio, there has been a 115,000 increase in seats and 60% of the fleet is electric compared to 48% at the start of the franchise. Um, and that proves why control by this parliament and this government can be beneficial. However, the ScotRail franchise is not operating the way we would all wish it to do. Um, that's again a problem because of the legislation we have inherited. Um, the Scott Rail franchise could until 2016 attract only private company bids because public bids were specifically forbidden under UK statute, despite what Labour have argued in the past. And the Labour Party would like to keep this quiet, along with the fact that the Labour-led Welsh Government has contracted the rail service of Wales to private French and Spanish-owned firms. The 200 and 2005 Railways Act passed by Labour extended devolved powers to include management and monitoring of ScotRail services, but the power to secure future ScotRail franchises um, remained. Re, the power to secure future ScotRail franchises uh, was, was not taken forward until until 23rd of May 2016, uh, when the Scotland Act came into force. That was 19 months after Abilio won the bid in October 2014. Unlike Labour, the Scottish National Party have fought for the inclusion of public sector bids in the Scottish Rail franchise for years. In the 2015 general election, our manifesto included a commitment that public sector organisations should be able to bid to operate rail services as allowed in EU law, but prevented by UK legislation. And the 2016 Scottish Parliament manifesto said the same thing. The UK Williams Review is ongoing and there is a real opportunity and solid reasoning here to change the structure of rail service delivery in Scotland. That rail service delivery must be devolved in its entirety so that Scottish ministers can take a joined up approach to delivering it full control and full responsibility. Anything less will not meet the expectations of the 100 million passengers in Scotland using the service. Scottish Government's £18 million investment, independent oversight and the performance remedial plan and associated Donovan review uh, do stand to improve resilience. The fact is that more drivers, better timetables and a fleet of modern trains are contributing to a service which is improving after a period, admittedly, of unacceptable disruption in 2018. Of course, we must scrutinise Abilio's performance. Financial penalties and a break clause can be implemented should Abilio fail to remain on track, delivering the 19 remedial plan targets by June 2021. Presiding officer, I call upon members across the chamber to allow remedial plan performance outcomes and the Donovan and Williams reviews to take their course and that prior to the 31st of March 2020, the Scottish Government update members on these matters at that juncture. To Labour, I would say, get on board with the common sense approach, handing over full control of the rail for infrastructure to Scotland to help ensure we deliver for all our passengers. Thank you very much. Thank you. I call Neil Bibby, followed by Rachel Hamilton. Neil Bibby. Thank you, President Officer. It's customary at the outset for us to thank those who have taken the time to supply briefings to members ahead of debates. So I'd like to thank the rail unions for theirs. But I think it was remiss of the Minister, Joan McAlpine and the Tories, however, not to thank Abelio for their briefing, given they have so faithfully adhered to it this afternoon. Today, the Parliament has an opportunity to stand up for Scotland's hard-pressed passengers after years of a failing ScotRail franchise 
and misery for commuters. We can decide today that is enough is enough, that a belly old Scotland franchise will reach the end of the line in 2022, that it will not be renewed or extended for another three years. That the interests of passengers must come first and that our rail services must be returned to the public sector at the earliest opportunity. We face a simple choice, public transport run as a public service in the public interest or the continuation of the ScotRail shambles and this government's failing deal with Abellio. Abellio have had four and a half years to deliver what they promised at the outset of the deal, a deal the SNP said would be world leading and they haven't. Targets, contractual targets have been missed. As Mike Rumbles said, there have been three improvement plans since the franchise began, yet improvements have not been sustained. Passenger satisfaction has fallen so short of the remedial plan target that the target itself has been reduced. 75,000 trains, as has already been said, have been cancelled since Abellio took over the franchise, an average of 47 every day. And industrial relations have worsened. I know the SNP and the Tories are opposed to our motion, but let's actually listen to the people who work on our railways. The RMT, who have been demonstrating outside the Parliament today, say that Abellio is not fit to run the ScotRail franchise and that mismanagement has led to a serious deterioration of working conditions. The TSSA say the franchise is a shambles that has gone from bad to worse. The General Secretary of ASLEP says the Abellio deal has been a failure by nearly every measure and he goes on to say, ScotRail receives the second highest share of net government funding of any franchise in the UK. It is impossible to see the franchise as offering anything other than terrible value for money for the Scottish taxpayer and passenger. The Abellio deal is not working for passengers. It does not carry the confidence of workers and it does not represent value for money for taxpayers. In fact, the travelling public are being, paying twice for the SNP's dysfunctional deal with Abellio, not just paying some of the highest rail subsidies, subsidies in the UK, but paying for raising fares too. Paying more and more for a service that is not consistent enough and just not good enough. Scotland's passengers deserve better. They deserve rail services that are democratically controlled and run in their interests. The Minister and the SNP have said their amendment is about Scottish public sector control of the railways. It's not. It's about Dutch public sector control of the railways continuing for three more years. <laughs> if, if the governments of Germany, France and Italy, to name just a few, can run their national railways, and even the Dutch government can run our railways, then we can and must do the same in our country. Scottish Labour believes that railways should be brought into public ownership at the earliest opportunity as a matter of principle. Yet surely even those who do not accept that principle cannot surely believe that Abellio will have earned the right to have this deal extended, and certainly not till 2025. If they do, they either cannot be among those of us who actually travel by train on a regular basis, or they are totally out of touch with Scotland's passengers. It's time to bring the Abellio deal to an end. It's time for a publicly owned People's ScotRail, a People's ScotRail under democratic control, a People's ScotRail fully integrated with our public transport system, a People's ScotRail that puts passengers before profit. That's the future Labour chooses for our railways, and that's why I will vote for the motion today. Thank you. Thank you. I call on Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We all know that the performance of the service on Scotland's railways is far from satisfactory. Delays, cancellations and mismanagement have all led to commuter misery and economic damage. It's estimated that train delays cost the Scottish economy up to 230,000 a day. And in my constituency, poor performance is hindering efficient commuting and damaging the local economy as a result. On the Borders Rail, which many of my constituents use daily, uh, to commute to and from Edinburgh, we've seen some of the worst delays and cancellations. Just last week, we saw that ScotRail's punctuality was at its worst for August and September since Abellio took over the franchise in 2015. But not surprising, and news we are all too f familiar hearing about. The Scottish Conservatives have made it clear in the past, by my colleagues as well, that we do not want 
to see the renationalisation of Scotland's railways. And that is not the solution we are seeking here. Labour have made this clear on numerous occasions, and it is a move which will not benefit the taxpayer in the slightest. Wasting time and money will not get people to work on time. It will not stop ordinary people being fined from being late to their nurseries, picking up their children. The idea of renationalisation of our railways is a mere sticking plaster. Michael Matheson says that his government has taken robust action, but I must question that, presiding officer. We need to see better accountability, and the SNP must stand up for commuters, rather than give ScotRail a continual licence to fail. They must stick to their promises and properly hold them to account. Remedial plans are only effective if the Transport Minister ensures that ScotRail are committed to those improvements and that they are called into question when they are not. No more ministerial waivers. We need to see better accountability. Commuters do deserve better. For months now, we've known that driver recruitment has been a significant issue, and only recently action has been taken. In order to ensure we have a sustainable rail service, we need to ensure that Abellio ScotRail continue to assess those workforce levels. Repeatedly, we have come to this chamber and be promised improvements, yet little in the way of things change for the better. On the Borders Railway, I was promised, once the driver training backlog was cleared, that we would see improvements in punctuality and service. There was some improvement in the short term, but it's just gone back to the same old. That is why these benches are calling for the Scottish Government to pro propose a long-term sustainable vision for the future of Scotland's railways that looks beyond 2025, which would include the issues of rolling stock and improve that rolling stock. A long-term plan that for whoever the operator may be, there is a clear direction of priorities so that passengers have the confidence that long-term improvement is on the way. In conclusion, commuters and passengers want to see greater transparency and accountability. And let's be clear, a public sector operator taking control of the ScotRail franchise shifts huge risk and potentially millions of pounds onto the Scottish taxpayer. This increased risk comes with a guarantee, without any guarantee, of an improvement in the quality of the service. I'm s qu very quickly. I'll be very brief. This is the last minute. People realise that when the East Coast Mainline came back into public ownership, we had a better service, better industrial rela relations, and a billion pounds delivered to the Treasury as a result. Is that not why we should bring it back? Rachel Hamilton. I completely disagree that uh, that was in a, a, a unique circumstances and we are in this remedial action point that needs to be seen through and there's also positivity, Mr Bibby, on the horizon, perhaps with the Williams review that you are overlooking. Which, and that, incidentally, will provide clarity on where governments need to focus, this government needs to focus its attention, where to make those improvements, such as delivering value for money, delivering clear accountability and putting customers at its heart. Because let's not forget, customers are not mentioned in this chamber that often. And today, it's all about customers and they need to be at the heart of this. Our amendment finally, presiding officer, aims to give ScotRail the chance to fully try and implement the course of action set out in the remedial plan, rather than terminating the franchise early. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Stuart McMillan before we move to closing speeches. Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you very much, presiding officer. Presiding officer, nobody can argue that ScotRail uh, have performed perfectly since they've had the contract. Uh, they do have problems and they do have issues, uh, but that uh, and that was the case also long before Abellio got the contract. The, the, no, it's not. I'm not saying it's all right then. I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is uh, that uh, in any type of organisation, there will always be issues and problems. It's how you actually work with them to try to actually rectify these. And certainly in the situation that we face, in the situation that the passengers face day in, day out, uh, I, I understand why passengers can be angry and are angry and are frustrated. Uh, and certainly, actually, I was talking to uh, Claire Baker uh, only a couple of weeks ago uh, and, and the issues of, uh, of rail. Uh, and Claire was highlighting some of the concerns that she has regarding uh, some of the train services in Fife. So, so genuinely, I, I appreciate that there are challenges, but there will be challenges in every single organisation. It's how you actually work to address them to make that service delivery 
better. Now, Labour's motion today it highlights one thing, not extending the franchise beyond 2022. And in Colin Smith's contribution, Colin's unfortunately leaving the chamber, but in Colin Smith's speech earlier on, he indicated that, that he is against fair increases. Now, uh, does this mean that the Labour are today announcing that if they were to ever, ever be in power in this parliament, that they would never institute a fair increase uh, uh, on, the, on ScotRail uh, and ticket prices. Now, now presiding officer, and that's certainly what it sounded like to me. And I, I generally would be grateful that when Labour are closing, if they could actually uh, deal with that particular point. Now, uh, presiding officer, I think it's also uh, quite important to highlight that, that at, as things stand at the moment, the, I don't know if any Labour Party politician wants to kind of highlight this later on, but, but did they acknowledge that in Scotland the average uh, increase in prices are lower than in England and Labour run Wales? And also can they explain that why their colleagues in the Welsh Government uh, choose, why their colleagues in the Welsh Government, Welsh Labour Government, choose to mirror the English fare at rises of 2.8% despite, despite having the power to apply a cap uh, for Wales only journeys? Now, saying also that uh, today, I, I, I want a common sense approach to actually take place. Now, I want, I want the common sense approach to actually bring infrastructure and services together under public control. It's essential that responsibility for our railways actually rests with the Scottish Parliament and bringing all the railways under full control to Scotland. Now, currently, as every member knows, Network Rail is unaccountable to this Parliament. And over 50% of Scottish Rail's delays were attributable to the UK government's shambolic operation of Network Rail. The Cabinet Secretary's amendment uh, indicates that, that the Scottish Government has already st started uh, the careful and necessary assessment specified in the franchise contract. Now, when Labour close, can they actually clarify uh, that if they actually want this due process just to be ripped up? Now, I, I generally wasn't, uh, wasn't sure in terms of what they were saying earlier on on this particular point. Now, now, I agree with the Scottish Government that franchising isn't fit for purpose, and I would like to see our rail under full public control. Now, I welcome uh, Labour's former minister, Tom Harris, urging that, that all lines, signals, stations and infrastructure under control of Network Rail should be transferred to a new body answerable to the Scottish Government. This highlights the, the challenge that exists for all of us, but also the opportunity that exists to bring control over all the rail services to this Parliament. Now, Elaine Smith, in her contribution, uh, uh, highlighted the point about nationalisation. But it's clear that we do not have the power to nationalise the railways. Now, under the current UK law, these powers still reside in Westminster, and the Scottish Government is obliged to competitively tender for delivery of rail services. Now, Labour continually pretend that we can nationalise rail services, but we cannot do that. If Labour stop actually misleading the population about this particular point, then I'm sure that we can all have a conversation on, based upon facts, not on Labour's fiction. Thank you very much, President Officer. Thank you, Mr. Will. And we move now to closing speeches, and I call Edward Mountain to be followed by Michael Matheson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And let's try and start on a consensual note. I think it's clear we all agree that ScotRail is underperforming and could do a lot better. The fact the Scottish Government have issued two remedial notices to ScotRail is clear indication they are not delivering for rail passengers. But unlike the Labour Party, we believe ScotRail must be given the opportunity to, fill the, to fulfil the terms in those remedial notices. Labour's continuing calls to end the franchise, as, we, as we've heard from Liam Kerr, does not solve the problem. Indeed, I believe the motion is rather cynical. The motion doesn't say what they want to do to solve the problem. And if you don't say what you're going to do to solve the problem, it's not really helpful. But I can tell you they articulated it today in the chamber, and that was they believed that nationalisation would be the way to solve it. I don't believe they mentioned it in the motion so they could get the Liberal Democrats to support their calls. Um, but I think that's, that's the wrong way to go. Uh, presiding officer, we all know that nationalisation doesn't work. It's been tried before and failed. Doing the same thing over and over again, Mr Leonard, and expecting a different result is at best unwise. <laughs> We also know that having a public sector operator taking control of ScotRail would shift huge risk onto the Scottish taxpayer, as my colleague Rachel Hamilton has said. A risk based on civil servants running a business they don't have the knowledge or the expertise to do. And let me be clear, civil servants can't make rented rolling stock more reliable. 
nor they can, can they magic more stock from a finite pool held by rental companies, as we heard from Mr Kerr. And civil servants cannot generate more investment from the government they report to. And it's not blindly right, also, to call on network rail in Scotland to be devolved to the government. This will also not solve the problems. Network rail is not the sole issue. Now, the government often take time and the opportunity to quote the Office of Rail and Road, who have said last year network rail were the overall cause of 58% of Scott Rail delays. That's the figure they give you. But let's dig a little deeper. Take out the delays due to severe weather and track incursions that no one frankly control, then delays attributed to network rail fall to around 42%. Still, that is still too much, but it is a huge shift, shift in the balance. Now, we do accept that Scott Rail are at fault for some delays. In the last year, delays by their uh, problems with their fleet have increased by over 30%. And delays caused by problems with the Scott Rail's train crew have increased by 50%. These are Scott Rail's problems, and Scott Rail's must solve them, as they have been asked to do under the remedial plan. <coughs> so, sorry, excuse me, presiding officer. But blaming everything on network rail or Scott Rail, in my mind, is disingenuous. So everyone, I'm afraid I'm in my last minute, Mr. Rumbles, but so everyone needs, I believe, to step up to the plate. Network Rail, Scott Rail and politicians. Now is not the time for more th threats to Scott Rail and Abellio. Now is the time for the Scottish Government to continue to work with Scott Rail and Abellio to improve their performance. It's time to begin the work on the long-term long -term sustainable plan for Scotland Railways beyond 2025. Yeah. The Scottish Government wants to look at this long-term future for our railways, which I'm afraid is not furthered in my mind or our minds by the Labour motion. We need this long division, uh, vision, which at the moment the Government haven't articulated. Secondly, we need effective management, something which I'm afraid I believe has been ineffective in the last few years. This afternoon, Presiding Officer, this party will not be supporting the Labour motion or the Government's motion because they're more about politics and not about what is best for our railways. And that is what we want to see. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call on the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, uh, President Officer. Can I um, uh, begin, uh, like a number of members have done, to, uh, to recognise the outstanding work of uh, staff within the rail network within uh, Scotland. Uh, I meet with them on a regular basis, and I'm struck by their commitment and dedication uh, to doing the very best in the role that they discharge within Scotland's rail network. Um, I was struck by the point that was made by John Finney and his contribution uh, around some of the challenges which have been experienced in recent months, including the challenge which we experienced on the West Highland Line uh, with the very significant uh, damage that was caused to uh, the line just south of Cray and Larrach. And when I visited the site, uh, I met with the network rail employee who had walked the line that night on his own, uh, suspecting that damage may have been caused. Um, and I note Mr Finney met with them, uh, may have been caused, uh, which resulted in averting potentially, uh, potentially a very serious incident from occurring, which in itself uh, just demonstrates the dedication uh, and excellent staff we have uh, throughout the network in Scotland. I'll give way to Mr Finney. John Finney. Thank you. I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. I indeed, that was commendable work, as is the commendable work of the people who man the ticket offices and provide support. Does the Cabinet Secretary share my concern at the intention to close a number of these ticket offices across Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I do, uh, because it's important we make sure that we have the right type of staff in place to support the travelling public uh, at stations, uh, whether it be in rail or anywhere else, uh, to assist them in doing so. But it's also the dedication of the staff that have helped to deliver the electrification of our lines, the new stations that have been built, the new trains that have been manufactured, uh, the uh, passenger services which are provided, uh, and also uh, those who uh, undertake the challenging work at times uh, on our rail uh, system. I also suspect, President Officer, listening to the comments in this debate, that there are very few in here that believe that the franchising system we have at the present moment is the optimal system. It is a system which we should continue with. I certainly don't believe it is, and it's one that has to go. Just to lodge a bid, not to secure a bid, just to lodge a bid costing the region of £10 million. So even though we have secured the power for a public sector body to be able to bid for a franchise, not secure a franchise, bid for a franchise, it will cost that public sector body 
some £10 million just to go through that particular process. That in itself suggests to me that the existing system is not fit for purpose. And in my engagements with uh, Keith Williams, I've been struck by his genuine commitment uh, to looking at how he can improve the rail system, not just in the UK, but specifically here in Scotland. Uh, but it also needs the UK government to genuinely recognise the opportunity to run the network in Scotland in a different way that reflects the needs and aspirations of the people of Scotland. And when Rachel uh, Hamilton called for a long-term plan to be put in place, uh, part of the challenge in delivering a long-term plan is the very franchising structure we have in place at the present moment because of the 10-year period in which they operate, which creates a fracture in being able to get that type of long-term plan that is absolutely critical to be able to deliver the changes which are necessary in the future. I can turn to the issue that was raised by Elaine Smith. Elaine Smith in saying that uh, the events on the 24th of August were unacceptable. Absolutely correct. Completely unacceptable. Uh, and that's why there was a full review undertaken to address uh, why those events uh, took place. But I'm also aware that our rail network has managed major events before and managed them very well. I'm also aware that staff in Network Rail worked extremely hard to extend the two platforms at Queen Street to get them extended in time for the festival taking place so that they could increase capacity in the trains by some 20% over, uh, over the course of that period. So I think we should also recognise the work that they're undertaking in delivering that. General Officer, I'm very conscious of... of a, no, I'm, apologies, I don't have time. More than happy to engage with the member at uh, some other point on this particular issue. General Officer, tonight's an opportunity uh, for the Labour Party to put the rhetoric aside and to step up to the plate and to actually support the possibility of creating a public sector rail service here in Scotland. Not to create a UK-based body that will run all of the UK's rail network, taking powers away from this Scottish Parliament and running trains, but instead... Instead, giving powers to this Scottish Parliament to be able to run a public service railway. So tonight at five o'clock, at five o'clock, we'll find out what the leadership of Richard Leonard is really about. Is it supporting the Tories and voting against the ability to run a public service railway in Scotland? Or is it backing the SNP and this Parliament the ability to do so? I know, given his record as a leader, he'll be back in the Tories tonight and walking away from a public service railway here in Scotland. We'll stand up for it, we'll deliver it, give us the powers to do it, and we'll make a difference to Scotland's travelling public. And I call on Colin Smith to wind up our yes. debate this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, President Officer. I think this afternoon's debate has made clear the utter failure at the heart of Scotland's railways, and in particular, the complete and utter lack of any answers from this Scottish Government and the Cabinet Secretary. And as speaker after speaker exposed the extent to which a Belius Scott Rail franchise is letting down Scotland's rail passengers. Elaine Smith described the utter dangerous chaos we saw on the trains during the last day of the Edinburgh Festival. Neil Bibby highlighted the need for this government to start to listen to those people who work on our railways uh, and deliver the service to their customers. And to be fair to Liam Kerr, he provided a scathing assessment of the utter failure of the railways under privatisation. It's clear that passengers from this debate right across the country are being let down, not just by this franchise, but by a government more concerned with making excuses for a bilio than delivering better services for passengers. And, President Officer, we certainly had our fair share of excuses today. The Cabinet Secretary told us, with the full support, I have to say, with every single Tory yeah. speaker today, that we should just forget the last four years yeah. of this franchise, because the remedial plan will come along and improve punctuality and reduce cancellations. Delivering, we are not one, but two improvement plans have failed. Scott Rail's last chance saloon, according to the First Minister. But, President Officer, punctuality is now lower than it was when the Cabinet Secretary agreed the plan in February. And the latest cancellation figures are the worst for that period since records began. And what about the second remedial plan on passenger satisfaction the Cabinet Secretary talked about? Will the government accept it won't deliver the franchise targets, so they've just decided to reduce those targets instead. President officer, passengers deserve better, but it's clear from today's debate the SNP want to extend the franchise to 2025, something that the Transport Secretary, to be fair, has already admitted when he wrote to me and said he fully expects the current franchise to continue until then. 
And it seems, however, that the SNP have an ally in the Tories when it comes to giving Abilio another licence to fail. The Tory amendment fundamentally misunderstands what we are voting on today. Of course, Abilio ScotRail will have a chance to complete the remedial plans if Labour's motion is agreed, because that plan runs to May 2020, but the first exit date in the franchise isn't until March 2022. And I hope that remedial plan does get Abilio ScotRail out of breach of the franchise, but we know it won't deliver the franchise targets they've been set, and frankly, that's not good enough. So I say this to Tory MSPs today. Don't you ever come to this chamber again and shed crocodile tears for Scotland's rail passengers. Because today, today, every single one of you had the opportunity to do something about it, but every one of you bottled it. Faced with a choice between the big rail firms and your constituents, true to form, you back the rail bosses. You put their profits ahead of passengers, side in with the SNP to extend this failed franchise until 2025. And today, the SNP tried to pretend they supported public ownership. Well, for at least five minutes until John Mason got to his feet and rubbished it. <laughs> if the SNP were committed to public ownership, it would end the ScotRail franchise at the earliest opportunity and get serious about a public sector bid. It would recognise that ultimately we need an end to the wasteful and inefficient franchising system altogether and they would back Labour's calls for the repeal of the Railway Act 1993 so we can have proper public ownership of our railways, bringing train and track together where services are delivered by a publicly owned company. But crucially, crucially, and something the Cabinet Secretary continues to mislead people on, decisions on all those Scottish routes would be made by this Indeed. Scottish Parliament. Indeed. And crucially, and crucially, where the government would have a seat at the table when it comes to those cross-border services, something the Cabinet Secretary clearly does not want. That's Labour's vision for our railways. A vision that starts to put passengers first, not the profits of the privatised companies. A vision where the workforce or the managers of change, not its casualties. A vision where our public services start to serve the people, not the profiteers. President officer, it's time for this parliament to get on board with that vision. Stop acting as a cheerleader for privatisations and unite to find a fight for a railway that's fit for purpose. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on Don't End the ScotRail Franchise. The next item of business is consideration of Business Motion 19209 in the name of Graeme Day on behalf of the Bureau setting out a business programme. Could I call on Graeme Day to move this motion? A move, presiding officer. Thank you very much. No one has asked to speak on the motion. The question, therefore, is that Motion 19209 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the next item is consideration of... Uh, Parliamentary Bureau motions 19210 and 19211 on approval of an SSI. Can I ask Graeme Day to move these motions? Moved, presiding officer. Thank you very much. And we'll hear those at decision time, to which we now come. The first question this evening is that Amendment 19193.1 in the name of Marie Todd, which seeks to amend motion 19193 in the name of Ian Gray on the Give Them Time campaign, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 19193.1 in the name of Marie Todd is yes 57, no 60. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that motion 19193 in the name of Ian Gray on the Give Them Time campaign be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is an amendment in the name of Michael Matheson, and I would just highlight that there's a preemption. So if this amendment is agreed, then the amendment in the name of Jamie Green will fall. So the question is that amendment 19190.2 in the name of Michael Matheson,
which seeks to amend motion 19190 in the name of Colin Smith on don't extend the ScotRail franchise be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. That's not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 19190.2 in the name of Michael Matheson is yes 57, no 60. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 19190.1 in the name of Jamie Green, which seeks to amend motion 19190 in the name of Colin Smith, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 19190.1 in the name of Jamie Green is yes, 28, no, 89. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. And the next question is that motion 19190 in the name of Colin Smith on don't extend the Scott Rail franchise be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 19190 in the name of Colin Smith is yes, 32, no, 85. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore not agreed. And I, I propose, all right, thank you. Thank you, thank you colleagues. I propose to ask, uh, Thank you, colleagues. I propose to ask a single question on the two parliamentary bureau motions. Does anyone object? No. That's good. Uh, the question is that motions 19210 and 19211 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you very much. That concludes decision time. We're going to move shortly to members' business in the name of Emma Harper on Scottish Women and Girls in Sport Week. But we'll just take a few moments' pause for members and the Minister to change seats.